Manitoba has started looking into legislation regarding concussion and concussion recognition and management specifically. So we've developed a committee uh, and really Dr. Mike Ellis has spearheaded this movement. Uh, he's on several committees across Canada. Uh, he's a physician that works out of the Pan Am Concussion Centre uh, within the MTS Iceplex and he deals mainly with youth concussion. So with some of these regulations, some of these things, we're looking mainly at youth concussion. Adults are a little bit different scenario, but still the same guidelines, same symptoms, uh, very similar issues. So just a quick little background on my involvement in basketball. Uh, obviously as the head therapist at the University of Winnipeg, um, unfortunately Tanya has seen me a few too many times this year. I think she's going to put a little alarm for me coming down the hallway uh, soon on telling her about injuries. Um, telling any athlete they can't play in sport is not the best part of my job or any coach's job. Uh, so we want to make it as clear as possible and make that process as painless as possible within the realm of concussion. Uh, my other involvement would be as a parent with a, an 11 year old in the community basketball ranks. He's been playing for three years uh, and uh, enjoying every minute of watching that. So who is this targeted to? Uh, first of all, I should say this is a generic presentation that will go to all sports within Sport Manitoba. So this isn't a presentation that just I've come up with. This is something that's approved through uh, Sport Manitoba, Parachute has been a big uh, supporter of this. They've recently revamped this, so uh, I'm really happy to present a, a brand new presentation in front of uh, all of you, uh, and uh, I will try and get through it as quickly as we can so we can get some questions in at the end if, if possible. Uh, so like I said, this presentation is for everyone involved in sport. So. We want to educate everyone from the parents, athletes, officials, all of the above. Uh, everyone has a role, especially like Adam said, in uh, preventing concussion. This is where we're you know, best served in, in trying to reduce the number of concussions. So again, this is a general education. I don't think I'll give any earth shattering news here. It's more trying to get everyone on the same page. Uh, we actually have a seminar next week for all of the medical professionals that will be delivering this presentation uh, run through the Sport Medicine and Science Council, which is another group within Sport Manitoba that's helping with this concussion process. And we want to educate everyone so that this is delivered very similar across the board. So we have all coaches, officials, athletes understanding the process when a concussion may have happened. And I just have to give a little disclaimer on where it comes from. So all of the information in this is referenced. Sport Manitoba is on board. We've already talked about the uh, Basketball Manitoba website. There's some great information on there to help coaches. I would highly recommend printing some of those forms. You have some of them in the booklet that you can keep with you. I'll talk more about the uh, sport concussion recognition form. Uh, that is an extremely important one. Uh, and then each of the provincial sport organizations are in the process of developing their protocol. Basketball Manitoba has kind of uh, moved ahead of the curve a little bit and got this out there on their website already. And there's a few other leaders within Sport Manitoba that have done so. This is where our information comes from. Every four years, there's a group of concussion experts that meet uh, across the world. I think last one was in Zurich in 2016. They published all of their findings in 2017 and uh, have come out with guidelines for medical professionals, guidelines for assessment, guidelines for management, guidelines for return to play, uh, all of the above. And the Canadian guideline on concussion and sport through parachute follows that document as well. So this is why we're here today. Everyone should be now going through this process of an education on concussion and rec recognition specifically, but also understanding the management process. 
There's a number of accommodations that athletes might need throughout uh, the concussion process. And uh, it's important to understand those and be understanding of what they might need. So I'll, I've got a whole list of things we're going to try and address. Um, any, everything from what is the concussion, how does it happen, uh, how do we manage it, what do we want to do when we're assessing it, uh, what are some of the signs of more severe injuries? Obviously, that's a whole different issue and something we take a lot of training on in a sports first responder setting if we're dealing with a, a cervical spine injury uh, or a more major head injury. And then what should I do if I suspect those injuries when I'm not trained in some of those things? Uh, what do we do if we suspect it's a concussion? We've ruled out all of these red flags and some of the major signs of cervical spine injury, nerve injury, that kind of thing. Uh, what do we do at that point? Uh, when, when can the athlete return to school and sport? I think in all of our settings, especially mine at a university, the first thing the athlete has to be able to do is go back to class. They're student athletes first. So we need to make sure they can go back into that setting and learn what they're supposed to be doing. They're getting a scholarship to go to school and play basketball or whatever sport it might be. So, and then a few other points. The medical assessment form is important, medical clearance letters, and uh, youth athletes undergoing baseline testing. I want to touch on that a little bit at the end because that's become a little more popular uh, as we see private clinics getting into that uh, business. So this is about as basic an, uh, a definition as you'll see of concussion. This is not the definition of concussion necessarily from the consensus statement that I talked about. Uh, their document is well over 50 pages long uh, and the definition takes up uh, a good chunk of one page for sure. But basically it is a functional injury. It's not a physical injury. So we can't there's no obvious bleeding, uh, you know, if we sprain an ACL, we'll see that knee swell by the next morning. Uh, if you strain a muscle, we can find some strength deficits. This is a harder injury to diagnose. And the trouble with us as therapists, even coaches, uh, we're, we're all kind of in this together, that none of us can really diagnose this injury. It's the physicians that are going to be in charge of diagnosing the injury. This is where we start the referral process. So, but concussions definitely affect the way the athlete thinks. It may affect the way they move. It depends what part of the brain has been affected. So what causes a concussion? I think we've all seen concussions. They're on the highlights almost every night or at least weekly um, when we watch the Sportsnet or TSN highlights. There's any blow to the head, face, neck, or body that causes a rapid head movement or jarring. It can be rotation, it can be extension, side flexion, doesn't really matter. The brain sits inside the skull and it doesn't have ligaments like our knee does. It can still move around inside that skull. So it kind of bumps up against the inside of the skull. Depending what part of the brain has been uh, aggravated, the symptoms can match that. The trouble is there's no MRI or CT scan to show us what's been damaged. We have to go on signs and symptoms only. And this is where that consensus statement comes in. The main thing with this is direct contact to the head is not needed. I've heard quite a few times, especially people slipping on the ice or maybe getting their feet taken out under the basket. It doesn't have to be on the court. Um, they fall backwards and say, well, I didn't hit my head. I, I can't have a concussion. That quick whiplash can absolutely cause a concussion. So here's some examples. I don't think I need to run through them all. We just need to be mindful that our athletes aren't with us 24 hours a day. So their injuries can happen almost anywhere, whether it was a car accident on the way to the gym. Maybe if we've got the younger athletes, they're out tobogganing, they crash. There can be all kinds of mechanisms. So we just need to be wary if someone's not feeling well, they're not acting right, what's happened? 
definitely getting to know your athletes and talking to them is extremely important. So now I know this is going to be quite small, obviously. This flow chart is part of the parachute concussion guidelines. It, I'll have the links for that later in the, in the presentation. But we are not, as I said, diagnosing a concussion. That's not the job of a coach or even the therapist. Uh, any injury that I see, I am strictly assessing that injury. If I think there's something more serious or something that needs to see a physician, I'm referring to that physician so they can diagnose the injury. They have access to all the other tests that can rule out major brain injuries specifically when we're talking about head injuries. So they have access to the MRI, CT scans that would show the more major injury, like uh, some type of intracranial bleed that would obviously cause major deficits in comparison to a concussion. And I should say where a lot of this comes from, if, if any of you are familiar with uh, the legislation in Ontario, it's called L Rowan's Law, that came out, I believe, last year. It may be a little over a year old. Uh, so they are in, in the process of working through all of the logistics of that law. The reason that came out is because of one youth rugby player named Rowan Stringer. She uh, suffered a concussion I don't know the entire story. The end of it is she, she ended up going back into the sport too soon, uh, suffered a second uh, head injury, and died from second impact syndrome. So these aren't common injuries, but they've definitely happened more than once. So we don't want to be that one that returns someone too soon. We don't know who's going to respond that way to more than one hit on the head. Uh, and it, what happens in that second impact syndrome is basically a diffuse swelling with inside the skull and it just puts too much pressure on the brain. So these are the major injuries we're trying to prevent. One of the main causes of prolonged symptoms in athletes is going back too soon. So if we talk about missing time, which I'm concerned about just as much as our coaches at the U of W, it doesn't look good on me if everyone that I'm seeing is taking an extra two weeks to get back to their sport. So we're trying to get people back as quickly and safely as possible. So if we recognize a concussion early, right when it happens, they come out, there's a six step protocol to get them back. That means they're out close to a week no matter what. So the sooner we can start that protocol, the better. If we let them go back and play, their symptoms are worse, maybe there's nausea, dizziness, we're adding more symptoms to it, we're prolonging that process. So when should a concussion be suspected? Well, it, really it's in any athlete that sustains a significant impact, whether it's being, you know, the feet being taken out under the basket, whether it's an elbow to the face, uh, it really, you have to judge whether it looked like that or not. Every athlete, though, responds differently to injury. So what looked like a minor knock to the head on one may be a more major injury for that person. It depends on how their anatomy is put together. So if, if any athlete reports a concussion or any concussion symptoms, this is where prevention comes in. And where athletes have to understand they're looking out for their peers, coaches are looking out for their players, as therapists we're looking out for the health of those players. Uh, I've heard a number of stories uh, even as in my time working here at the U of M several years ago working with the football team, players helping people back to the huddle uh, that they know have taken a hard hit on the head but they want that star player on the field next to them. As we work towards legislation, is that putting that person in a libel type situation? We've got to look out for our teammates and look out for our, our peers, look out for our players, uh, so that we're all looking for these injuries. Now in saying that, there's a lot of fear created within the media as well with these injuries. Most concussions 
will get better fairly quickly. And I'll talk about the length of time and maybe the difference between adults and children in a few minutes. So the basis of, well, let's go through a couple of myths first. These ones make it really hard on anyone assessing concussion, especially this myth right here. So if there are no instant symptoms after impact, there's no concussion. Well, we do our best, and I just had a quick talk with Kirby about this situation. This is the most difficult assessment for anyone, even if you're experienced in concussion. So if, if someone takes a hard knock on the head, they bounce up right away, yeah, you know what, coach, I'm fine. I got no problems. I can get right back in there. There's no dizziness, no nausea, no nothing. Is it reasonable to put that person back in? The best I can say is go with your gut on that. If they took a hard knock, athletes can be good at faking it as well. Am I right? They want to play. They don't want to lose their starting job. So that's the toughest part is deciding what's real and what's not. I haven't seen a lot of concussions where I don't see at least one symptom initially, but it can happen. I think what this slide is saying is these things can evolve over time. So they, if they go back in, start running, someone needs to be watching that person for sure. If there are no symptoms, we've allowed them to go back in, I think that's reasonable as long as you're comfortable that they don't have any symptoms, but we need to keep an eye on that person. Maybe they're subbed out at some point. Hey, how's it going? How do you feel? Any headache, nausea, dizziness? Go through the whole gamut. Make sure that you're not putting them in a dangerous situation because things can evolve. Symptoms can definitely feel worse the next morning. Just like anyone who's had whiplash, you know, maybe not so bad right after it happens, that next morning you wake up stiff and sore, hard to turn, neck injury can cause some concussion-like symptoms as well. So there's things that evolve through over, over time. So this one I think we're all aware of, but we've added it anyway, uh, that if, if you weren't knocked out, you don't have a concussion. To be honest, I've seen more concussions of people who haven't been knocked out than those that have. So there's maybe a little change in their level of consciousness, but they're not completely knocked out. They can still answer some of my questions, maybe not well, but they're still coherent enough to be able to answer. So obviously you do not have to be knocked out. If someone is unconscious, even for a second or two, then they obviously have a concussion. There's been a significant impact that's affected their brain temporarily that has caused a concussion. There is no way that someone has, that's hit their head and gone unconscious doesn't have a concussion. So this is an easy assessment. I don't need any fancy tools to tell me this person has a concussion. Symptom-wise, I'm not sure that you can all see this here, but I believe this one is in your, uh, in your info package there. There's several domains of concussion, physical, cognitive, there's emotional, sleep issues. So there's a few different things that, uh, that can come up. And the, the trouble is within that consensus statement that I keep referencing, there's 22 symptoms listed. If someone has had a mechanism of concussion and they have one of those symptoms, we unfortunately have to keep that athlete out of their sport for that day. We're not doing our job, we're not following the protocols that are given to you if we're not taking them out. So, and I'll let you go through the list, but uh, some of the more common ones, obviously, headache, pressure in the head, dizziness, neck pain is common. Now, neck pain is an iffy one. This is where, if there's major neck pain, and we'll talk about some of the red flags in a minute, that's a whole different issue that needs to see a physician uh, sooner rather than later. And obviously different cognitive issues uh, that, that one of the cards in your book there, the uh, concussion recognition tool has all of these listed. 
Okay? Some, of, some of this may come up right away. I've had athletes extremely angry with me uh, when I'm assessing their concussion, and it's before I've told them whether they can play or not. And that's, again, getting to know your athlete. If it's out of character for them to be yelling and screaming at you, maybe this is part of their symptom. So patience in these assessments is absolutely necessary. The sleep issues, obviously this isn't an immediate assessment. These are part of the uh, recognition or the uh, Fort Concussion Assessment Tool 5. This is added on at the end. People can have all kinds of different sleep issues, usually either trouble falling asleep uh, or trouble waking. Um, and those are obviously assessed later on. So some obvious signs. Uh, I don't think I need to review these. If someone's just taken a hit on the head and they're not moving, obviously we need to go to attend to them. Uh, some of this is, uh, again, this is a basic presentation to be given to coaches of all ages uh, and all different levels. Um, so we want to make sure we're not missing anything. The other side here, these ones again are pretty obvious and uh, I've actually had this uh, with my daughter once playing ringette, ran head on into somebody, coaches call me in to have a look at her, I come into the dressing room and she's got the sort of wide-eyed stare, you know, staring a million miles away. I don't need any more of an assessment to keep her out. That's not the way she normally acts. Right, so that bl blank or vacant stare is a big one. Uh, if you come in at halftime, someone's just taking a knock on the head and they've got their head buried in the towel, you know, kind of staring at their feet. Like, coach, I can't look up at the lights. I'm listening, but I can't look up at you. That's a pretty good idea that, that they've had some type of concussive injury. They need to sit out and be assessed further. So red flags, these go above and beyond concussion. This is if someone is complaining of major neck pain, they're kind of unwilling to move their neck. Maybe they've got some weakness or tingling or burning sensations down their arms or legs. These are signs of potential nerve injury in their neck. We have to, first of all, not move that person and we need an ambulance so those EMTs can properly transport that person without uh, aggravating any of the nerve injury from that. Some of these other symptoms are things that can develop. We talk about symptoms developing. Uh, some of the bleeds that can happen within the skull are very slow and we want to monitor the person for the next 24 to 48 hours for all of these symptoms. Are they, is their conscious state getting worse? Are they not really responding to my questions the way they did after the game? A big one is repeated vomiting. If, if they all of a sudden develop severe nausea and throwing up, I'm sending that athlete to the hospital. They need to be assessed to make sure we're not missing a major brain injury that can be life-threatening or life-altering for sure. Okay, and then a number of others. Double vision is, a, is an important one as well. So what should I do? Obviously we're calling the ambulance, we're not moving the person, stabilizing their head and neck, all of the basic first aid type things, and I, I'm not going to go through the first aid here, but uh, we just don't want to be moving this person. Another thing for anyone with a concussion, whether they have these major injuries or not, is I don't want to leave them alone. We need to monitor them for the first little while and see what's happening. Maybe they sit and rest for 10 minutes, 5 minutes, and we reassess them. In some of the studies that are out there, exercise can cause symptoms like concussion. You get a coach that runs their team hard and ask the athletes who feels tired and has a headache, well, half of them probably put up their hand, so, but none of them have hit their head. So this is where we want to watch these athletes after they've had this mechanism of injury and see, maybe they say they're fine, there's no problem, maybe we run them a little bit. We need to get, okay, come on out, let's do warm up for after the half and let's see how you do. Let me know how you're feeling. You need to come talk to me 
before you've set foot on that floor. Okay, again, just again, this flow chart uh, is on the parachute website. It's just a quick flow chart to follow as far as assessing these injuries. It gives you an idea of how to refer, who to refer to. Obviously, if, if we've called the ambulance, I'd hope they're taking them to the hospital for medical assessment. I think that's a, an obvious one. Here's an important tool for you. As coaches, and even as a therapist, this is really why we're there if someone has a concussion or a potential concussion. We want to recognize uh, any symptom of concussion. They're all listed at the bottom. This tool is a pocket tool. It's made to be uh, small. Keep it in your pocket. Keep it in your uh, notebook on the sidelines so that you have an idea of what you're looking for. The red flags are listed. Uh, and then there's some orientation questions, just some quick questions to ask the athlete to see how oriented they are. So what should I do if I suspect a concussion? We have to remove the athlete, obviously. We've talked about that. They can't be allowed to return that day. What they need to do is see a doctor at the first availability afterwards because that doctor is the one assessing and diagnosing that concussion. If it's not a concussion, maybe they're back at practice two days later. Maybe they did just sprain a joint in their neck. It's causing some of their headache. They have no other symptoms, but it's the doctors that can rule that out for us. Again, that's passing on that liability uh, to a medical professional that has their liability insurance and has the training in diagnosing these injuries. They may use the tools that I talked about, the sport concussion assessment tool or uh, the child scat. They're used for different age groups. The child scat is for 5 to 12 year olds. The uh, scat 5 is for older kids and adults. So again, these tools are more for licensed medical professionals in a follow-up type scenario. In, during the game, that recognition tool is what you're using. Okay, so if they're removed for sort of precautionary reasons, uh, but there's no visual signs of concussion, no, none at all, the athlete may return to play, but they have to be monitored. Again, we've already talked about this a little bit. This is a, the most difficult assessment to me uh, in this setting. The, all the athletes want to return. We've just got to make sure that none of those 22 symptoms are there when I'm assessing. And also, I should say, if you have the opportunity to have a medical person work with your team, that is a huge advantage. Because really, coaches are in a bit of a conflict of interest with that. It's, it's a difficult position to be trying to win a game and try and decide on lineups and be the medical person assessing an injury. That makes it extremely difficult on you as coaches. Okay, as I said, all youth should receive a medical assessment. There's a few options in the city for that, whether we don't necessarily have to send the athlete to the hospital unless we have one of those red flag symptoms. If you're unsure, it's not wrong to send them there. But they should see a doctor within the next few days, whether it's Dr. Ellis at the Pan Am Center, there's other sport medicine clinics and physicians around the city as well. There's a medical assessment letter. So if they've been sent to the doctor and are not diagnosed with a concussion, they tell you, no, it is just a sprain in their neck. They're going to have some minor headache trouble. They should go get some treatment on their neck. They should be better in a few days. We want that documented. So then again, it's covering your own butt in that situation put that liability on the doctor, we have the letter that says they can come back. If they have been diagnosed with a concussion, that's a different form. They're now into the concussion protocol that we have to follow. Uh, there's some information as well on rural or northern communities. There's different communities that don't have direct access to a physician. Maybe it's a nursing station, nurse practitioner, whatever it might be. That's acceptable in that scenario. 
So it's important once they're diagnosed with a concussion, they have to go into this return to school and return to sport protocol, which this helps everyone be on the same page. So I'm lucky at the University of Winnipeg, we have an accessibility department. We're in communication with them and the athlete and the coach on concessions in class, some concessions at practice. How much can they do? How much should they not be doing? Each stage though in this process is 24 hours. So when they're starting back, maybe we're letting them, and I should say first, one thing that's changed in concussion protocols is we don't send people home and tell them to sit in a dark room, put your phone away, don't watch TV, don't call anybody, don't talk to anybody. We don't do that anymore. There's actually research coming out that early exercise and very mild aerobic exercise helps speed up the recovery process. So challenging the brain a little bit is, is what we're trying to do. What that little bit is, is what we're not sure of because, uh, and leave that up to us to decide on that. As medical professionals, we're in consultation with the doctor. We want to make sure people are going slowly through this process, but also quick enough to get them back into their sport or back into their classroom. So as I said, the return to sport strategy, I definitely come second to the return to learn. We obviously want to get people back into the classroom. If they can't write their exams, get their assignments done, how can we justify sending them to practice? That it's just not a fair way to do things and not fair to the athlete. We're pushing them too quickly through the process. But again, each step within the protocol takes 24 hours because symptoms can evolve over time. So if I'm looking at an athlete, I'll try and see them each day after their concussion unless things start to slow down on the progressions. Maybe we see them every two days, three days. But we want to, this used to be symptom free. They had to be symptom free before they started anything. Now it's called symptom limiting. So it means they're riding the bike enough to not cause any symptoms. We're trying to do, we're trying to challenge them a little bit, get their heart rate up, get the blood pressure up a little bit, get them moving right back to full contact practice. But after each of these steps, we wait till the next morning, reassess them. If they're fine, no symptoms have changed, we can start the next step. The important part is down here, sort of before full contact practice, before playing, they need to see a physician before they return to play. That's that medical assessment form that tells you they're okay to go back in at full speed. So that's where it's important that they provide that medical clearance letter, again, putting the liability back on the medical professional. Okay, here's the time frames. This is, we don't give the severity of concussion anymore before the person is healed. So we just don't know how long it's going to take each individual to get through this process. So most athletes will be better for sure within a month, but some are better within a week. It just depends on the severity of the injury uh, and depends on the individual. So we, we really don't know until they've recovered how severe the concussion is. There are a percentage of patients, I'd say 30% is a bit high, but I guess it's possible in some settings that you know 15 to 30% of patients might take a little bit longer. Now, what I usually say here is if I could get 85% of my ankle sprain patients better in a week to two weeks, like the adult range, the coaches are going to be pretty happy with me. So if we can do the same with concussion, I think we're doing pretty well. It means we're taking them out early enough and we're looking after them properly through that return to play protocol. Anyone with persistent symptoms needs to be supervised by a physician. The physicians, whether it's a family physician, sport medicine physician, uh, Dr. Ellis, who happens to be a neurosurgeon, they can refer on to other professions, whether it's neuropsychology, whether it's someone that can do some vestibular retraining, some balance retraining, some vision training.
there's different things that may need to be rehabbed along the way that can help this progress. So we talked about prevention early. Adam mentioned it. Prevention is extremely important. Um, if I'm to give an example, in watching my son's 10-year-old basketball, having a parent teach their son to rebound with their elbows high and swing their elbows when they receive that rebound to make sure nobody wants to come close to them, to me that's teaching a 10-year-old to give another 10-year-old a concussion. That's not acceptable anymore. And the same way in the NHL, if anyone's familiar with Scott Stevens, he used to throw some of the hardest body checks around. Uh, he would have been suspended probably above 50 times by now in the NHL's new sort of concussion era, if you want to call it that. They're now considered headshots, these blind hits. So teaching young kids to deliver a concussion would be a pretty liable situation for me if concussion legislation was to come in. So we've really got to think about the ways, you know, they're still going for it in the game, obviously. We want people going hard, working hard, playing to win, um, but not at the expense of anyone's health, especially brain injury. So how can we prevent it? It's mainly education. This is the link to the website if you haven't seen it already. Uh, the Basketball Manitoba, I said, is, as I said, they're ahead of the curve for sure on this. Uh, they have a lot of information, very helpful to all the coaches. Other sites are uh, Parachute and Cirque, which I believe is called the Sport Information Research Center. There's a number of great things uh, within these. Even uh, some of you have probably done the Making Headway course within the uh, coaches' uh, website. Again, great information. Um, the Canadian Guideline on Concussion and Sport, again, that's on the Parachute website. There's an app within Parachute that has some of these uh, documents within that app. Easy to call up on your phone. You don't have to bring the pocket recognition tool with you. You can download the medical assessment form and some of these other forms that I've talked about uh, right off the Parachute Canada site. Keep them in your binder, uh, keep them with you uh, so that you have them. The, the recognition tool is there. These ones are more for medical professionals, but if you have a student therapist or a physiotherapist, athletic therapist, whoever it might be working with your team, they should have these with them uh, to assess after any event when the concussion was suspected. Okay, so I encourage you to visit that site. One last thing is talking about baseline testing. So uh, this was added in, Dr. Ellis again is on a national committee that's looking at this. There's new research out there that baseline testing in youth is really not useful in a concussion recognition realm. So there's clinics out there making money off of these baseline tests, but for us and for you to recognize a concussion, the baseline test really does nothing in that realm, except cost the team money. So there is a document uh, regarding this on recommendations for baseline testing. We do baseline testing at the University of Winnipeg, but the reason we do that is I have a physician that oversees that testing, and they can make the referral to the neurologist uh, to assess that test. Okay, so really baseline testing of youth is not required. Where baseline testing is useful for me is I get to know the athlete. I get to meet them one-on-one -on -one and I get to know what they're like. So if I'm assessing their concussion, uh, I know what they're normally like and I can recognize the symptoms much easier. So if there's one recommendation, it would be to get to know those athletes early. Okay, one place where baseline testing is considered is any athletes with learning disabilities, mood disorders, uh, any mental health issues. These are all things that are seen to prolong concussion. So uh, we want to be careful with those people. So we're helping them as best we can and making accommodations for them. 
okay? So uh, Sport Manitoba has many resources for this. I would encourage the Basketball Manitoba site. If I was to leave with one quick message, it's these four things. We've got to be able to recognize that concussion. If we recognize that they do have symptoms, they've had the mechanism for it, they have to come out of the game. Refer them on to a healthcare professional, and then we only return them once that healthcare professional has given you the document to return them. So I was hoping to finish with 10 minutes left, sorry. Uh, and I know parts of this, or maybe all of it, is pretty dry. This is a presentation, like I said, that is just basic information for everybody. This presentation will be given, is hopefully going to be modified throughout the next year or so, and delivered to many different sport governing bodies and sports groups uh, over the next little while. So I'm happy to try and answer any questions uh, if we have some. Yeah, so, so the question is if an athlete is uh, really drowsy or fatigued after taking a knock on the head, what do we do? Do we keep talking to them, how to keep them awake? I would say definitely. You want to keep, what we're doing is trying to stimulate the brain to stay conscious, right? So um, you're trying to comfort that athlete too. So that's that, if we go back several slides, is staying with them and talking to them for sure. You, you want to, that athlete needs someone with them. And again, that's monitoring progression of symptoms. If that drowsiness or it, that's really changing the level of consciousness that they have, so that may be an ambulance situation. If they've gone from the end of the game where they're just kind of tired, not feeling good, to where they're sleepy and can't open their eyes, not answering your questions, that would concern me a little more. That's quick deterioration that we don't normally see with a basic concussion. We want to make sure they don't have a more serious brain bleed. So if, just in case everyone didn't hear that, it's a question about electronic use after concussion and is there anything new on that? Well, the consensus statement doesn't really talk about that specifically, but uh, it, it's really a judgment call at that point on how much stimulation that person can take. Because one of the symptoms that can come up is light sensitivity. So I think those people often find that holding a bright phone in front of them bothers them and they just can't do it. So that's where we're trying to get to know that athlete and what their symptoms are and be able to decide what they can and can't do. And again, that's where a, you know an early referral to a medical professional helps you decide what to do as well. They can hopefully give them some more advice because there are so many different domains of concussion. Um, it's a difficult injury to rehab for sure because the rehab that we have right now is really time with guided return to learn and return to exercise. There's not a, you know, if they have a neck injury, we can do some massage or some treatment on that. There's not a lot else out there. There's some starting to be some, it's called vestibular ocular training that can retrain their vision, which again would be one of those situations that they may have trouble reading. It makes them feel nauseous or dizzy Again, those are important symptoms to encourage them to report to the doctor. I, that, I hope that answers the question. 